I haven't had a proper cup of tea this morning, so, um, you know, let's see how this goes. I've had green tea, green tea, so it has some caffeine in there, um, but we'll see how it does this morning. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that your word is spirit and life. And we thank you that your word always prospers. It accomplishes the purpose for which it has been sent. And so, Father, let our hearts now be ready to hear what you are saying to us this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs> now, the story of Noah is very well known throughout the world. Noah and the flood. And human beings had become so wicked that God decided he would wipe all creatures out by way of a flood. But Noah found favor in God's sight. He was a righteous man. And so God told him to build an ark and to take on board his family and animals so that the earth could be repopulated after the flood. And what I want to do today is to look at six lessons that we can learn from this flood episode. And the first lesson is this. The flood shows us God's ability to bring us through the most difficult circumstances. Noah, as I mentioned last week, was on the ark for over a year in total. And as I mentioned last week, with all the animals on there, it was noisy, it was smelly, it was messy. It was not a pleasant episode. But God brought Noah through this flood, and he is able to bring us through whatever flood, storm, circumstance we may be facing. In Romans 8, verse 37, Paul wrote, Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now notice what he says there, we are more than conquerors. More literally in the Greek, we more than conquer. They've made it into um, a description in this English translation here, but the Greek that word, more than conquerors, hupenikeo in Greek, it's in its verb form. So he's saying basically, in all these things, we more than conquer. In other words, there is activity involved. We do the conquering. We, we are not, it's not just a label that is put on us. We actually more than conquer. And hupenikeo, it's from, well, two words, hupa and nikeo. Nikeo being the word from which we get that brand Nike. And hyper, that basically means more than. It's um, hyper, we could say hyper in modern English, it comes from that. Um, more than a conqueror is um, the way it's translated here in the NKJV, but more literally, more, we more than conquer. It's something we do, this is a habit of ours. In all these things, everyone say all these things. So no matter what comes our way, we more than conquer. And that's the mindset we are to have. And we conquer in good times, we conquer in tough times. It is what it is, but we more than conquer. Now, why is it then that Noah came through the flood victoriously? Well, the answer is simple. It's because he built an ark. Imagine if when God said to Noah, build an ark, he said no. Or he said, I don't know why I should. I've never seen a flood before. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And when we listen to God, he will tell us to do things that may not initially make sense to us. But we must do them anyway, because God knows everything. And when he tells us to do something, we do it. As I shared, I think I shared it last week, you know, I like to say, when God says jump, we say, how high? But I heard one better. It was in a program, a military kind of thing, and um, there was some congressman or something, and this SEAL team had been charged with his safekeeping. 
and it was in Afghanistan and he was due to go there and the SEAL team wasn't particularly happy about the fact that this man was going on tour in this dangerous time and um, he basically told the man, you've got, you've got to do whatever we say and the, the congressman said, when you say jump I'll say how high and the soldier said, how about when I say jump, you jump <laughs> now that's one better because sometimes we can ask questions as a mean of procrastination and so we pause, we wait, instead of quickly doing what God told us to do. But Noah built the ark. In Hebrews 11 verse 7 it says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. So he did what God told him to do. Now, consider what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, 24 to 27. He said this, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. You come here today to hear the Word of God and to worship God and to fellowship. But the Word will do you no benefit, ultimately, if you do not obey what the Lord says. And Jesus said, look, whoever hears these sayings of mine. Now, not everyone has heard the sayings of Christ. But he says, whoever hears them but doesn't do them, he says, that person is like a house that was built and it couldn't withstand the storm. Storm will come either way. Notice Jesus said, look, the one who hears them and does them, when the storm comes, he'll be standing. So storms come to both the good and the evil. Following Christ is not a guarantee or a promise that we will not face difficulty. We will. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But if we do what Jesus says, then we will withstand the storm and still be standing. But if we hear him and don't do what he says, then we won't. We won't come through victoriously. And we can be diligent in reading the Bible, coming to church and all of that, but if we don't do what he said, we are kidding ourselves. And Jesus, let me tell you, the Sermon on the Mount, it, you don't get more advanced than that. And many of us would do well to read that sermon. And when Jesus gave that sermon, he wasn't, you know, running around. He wasn't even standing like I'm standing right now. He was sitting and talking to his disciples. And it was a practical sermon. He said, look, when you bring your gift to offer it at the altar, and you know you have something, or someone has something against you, go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your gift. The Sermon on the Mount gets to the very heart of things. It doesn't focus merely on externals. Jesus said, look, if you look at a woman to lust for her, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. You see, the law, well, I was going to say, the law dealt with external, that's not quite accurate at all. Because when Jesus said, if whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her in a heart, what he is doing is merely repeating the tenth commandment. Thou shalt not covet. That's all he's doing. And what Jesus did in his ministry, he said, don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I haven't come to abolish, but to fulfill. In other words, I'm filling it. I am showing you its true meaning. Because the problem was not the law. The problem was the misuse of it. 
And so Jesus said, look, don't think the law's just against adultery, it's against the lust that leads to it. And don't think you can worship God with your sacrifices if you have hatred, if, you're, if you need to be reconciled to someone. And what exists today, unfortunately, is a very convenient form of Christianity where people jump from church to church because they got an issue with this person. But Jesus said, look, if somebody sins against you, go and talk to that person, you and him or her alone. And if they don't hear you, take with you two or three others. And if they don't hear them, take it before the church. And if they don't hear the church, then let them be to you as a tax collector, which is not a very esteemed person in those days. This Christian faith is difficult. It calls us to do things that we don't want to do. It calls us to do things that make us uncomfortable, that our flesh cries out in pain as though it's being tortured. No way will I do that. But Jesus said, that's what you must do. Because if you can't, and if you're not willing to take up your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. And so everyone say this, I will be uncomfortable as I follow Christ. Get used to it. Now, on that merry note, I told you I had green tea this morning. Not normal tea. Don't know what effect it's having on me. But it's healthy. The second lesson I want to point out from the flood is this. The flood teaches us that God is with us in the most difficult circumstances. Not only that he brings us through them, but is with us. And by bring through, by the way, I don't mean to suggest that every difficulty you will be delivered out of. It would be very nice for me to say that, but it's not always the case. You see, so we need to know this, God is with us, no matter the situation. In the most difficult circumstances, God is there. As I pointed out last week in Genesis 7 verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark. Come into the ark. He didn't say go into the ark. He said come into the ark. In other words, God was in the ark and invited Noah to join him. He said come into the ark. Now last week... I pointed out to you, or I rather asked you to imagine what it would be like in that ark. With all those animals, the noise, the waste, they would eat food, it had to come out. It was not a very pleasant time, and it was for over a year. And that's what I asked you to imagine. But now I want you to imagine something else. Imagine that you spent over a year on a boat with God. Because that's what Noah did. God said, come into the ark. God was already there. Now imagine spending over a year on a boat with God. Now that would be a wonderful opportunity to get to know him, wouldn't it? I can hear your excitement. You're, you're still afraid of those animals. But focus on the Lord, guys. What's going on with the carnal thinking? Focus on God. Right? Now look. We need to focus on God. It's like Peter, Jesus came walking on the water. And Peter said, well, if it's you, tell me to come walking on the water to you. Which is an interesting thing to say. And Jesus said, come. Everyone say, come. So we've got that word again. Come. And what happened? Peter started walking on the water. But then when he noticed the wind and the waves or whatever it is he noticed, he began to sink. And so it is in our life also. When we give too much attention to the winds and the waves, the storm, instead of focusing on Jesus, we begin to sink. But we need to look at Jesus, looking unto him, the author and finisher of our faith. We look to him. Now, it so happens that the afflictions we face, the difficult times, are often 
an opportunity to get to know God better. Because God is on the ark and he says, come. And so it's an opportunity to get to know God better, and that's certainly been the case in my life. And in Psalm 119, verse 71, the psalmist said, it, it is good for me. Everyone say good. good. Notice he didn't say bad. He said, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. What an interesting thing to say. But when you go through a storm with God, you'll find yourself saying the same thing. Now, if you didn't go through the storm with God, you just went through the storm. And there's a difference between going through the storm and going through a storm with God. When you go through a storm with God, you allow God to teach you whatever he wants to teach you, and you change whatever he wants you to change. It's a learning experience. I'm not pretending it's all fun, because it's not. If it, if it was, it wouldn't be called affliction. I mean, affliction, that just sounds painful. And that's what it is. It was good for me, it said, that I have been afflicted that I may learn your statutes. In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, he said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And if you hadn't had your coffee or your tea, you may look at James and say, Oh, for goodness sake, calm down from your religious speak. Count it joy? What's wrong with you, James? I haven't had my cup of tea, stagnamit. You're, you're too happy. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. But he said what he said. And notice the word count. Everyone say count. So in other words, we need to calculate something in our minds. We need to think something through and decide to count it all joy. All of it, joy. No wonder James perhaps isn't your most popular book. I mean, he was serious. He gets to the point, and he said, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And that's exactly what Noah had, patience. Because he was in the ark for long enough, and then the rain eventually stopped, and he didn't immediately come up off the ark, he waited for a long time. And then he eventually sent out a raven, and then a dove, and then he had to wait, and it wasn't until God said to him, go off the ark now, get out of the ark, that he exited the ark. He had patience. I mean, if you'd been on the ark for that long, you'd want to get off there as quickly as you can. In Romans 5, 3 to 5, in fact, I didn't read verse 4 of James 1, 2 to 4, he said, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And then in Romans 5, 3 to 5, Paul wrote, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. That word tribulation, it simply means trouble. And he said, we glory in that. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Everyone say, knowing. Yeah. Now that's exactly what James said in James 1 verse 3. He said, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Paul says, knowing that tribulation, trouble, produces perseverance. So we have to know that we're not going through this thing in vain. There's actually a reason for it. And he says, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the Holy Spirit has been given to you. Why? One reason is to pour God's love out in your heart. In other words, the Holy Spirit causes you to know how much God loves you. And you've heard me say before that we, by the Holy Spirit, participate in the relationship that Jesus has with the Father. And the Father loves the Son. And the Holy Spirit, being the Spirit of God, He assures us of God's love for us. I wish I could go into that now, but I can't, because it's not today's assignment. But the Holy Spirit, listen, don't confuse a condemning voice for the Holy Spirit. He does convict us, but he doesn't condemn. In other words, when he rebukes us, there is a sense of God's love. Jesus said, as many as I rebuke, as many as I love, those I rebuke and chasten. 
There is a loving conviction and knowing in your heart that God is dealing with you about something. But that's very different than the voice of Satan who condemns. And the thing with condemnation, it doesn't encourage you to draw near to God. But when the Holy Spirit convicts you, yes, you are convicted, but you know you can draw near to God to put it right. There's a big difference between the two. The Holy Spirit pours out God's love in our hearts. It's interesting that this is said. Everyone say poured out. Because in this verse, poured out is used with reference to love. And he's saying that the love has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit or through the Holy Spirit. But normally when the phrase poured out is used and the Spirit is in that sentence, the reference normally is to the Spirit himself being poured out rather than the Spirit pouring something out. And this I believe is, in, is on purpose, intentional. Because what we learn here is that the Holy Spirit himself is the expression of God's love. Now this is why when Jesus was baptized, and I'm running ahead of myself here, God, it says that the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You see, the Holy Spirit is the expression of God's love. And so to have the Holy Spirit poured upon you is to have God's love poured upon you. The Holy Spirit emanates from the Father and, I believe, from the Son. Because He's the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. And He expresses to Christ the love that the Father has for Him. And He expresses to the Father the love that the Son has for the Father. And as people who are born of God, we are caught up in the middle of all of that. Because on the one hand, we are in Christ. And therefore, the Spirit of God not only conveys God's love to the Son, but because we are in the Son, the Spirit of God conveys God's love to us. Because we are now in Christ. And therefore we participate in that love that God has for the Son. But it's the other way around too. Because the Spirit of Christ, the same Holy Spirit, lives in us too. And the Holy Spirit expresses Christ's love for the Father. And this is why Paul said in Galatians 4 verse 6. He said, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. In other words, the Spirit of Christ enables us to participate in the relationship Christ has with the Father. That's why he says the Spirit of his Son was sent into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, which is what Jesus called God in Mark 14. He said, Abba, Father. The point is the Spirit brings us into that relationship. And so we are caught up in to this eternal act, this relationship within the Godhead. But our trials have a purpose. And Jesus himself went through a trial. Forty days in the wilderness. And that number 40 is used in the flood of the, the rain falling for 40 days. It's a number of testing, a number of affliction. It was the years that Israel, Israel spent in the wilderness. And you may be in your 40 years. It won't be 40 years exactly, probably, but the point is you may be in some kind of bizarre, weird season scratching your head as to what on earth is going on. But such times of testing demonstrate God's love for us because He's bringing out the gold in us and He's fortifying you in the furnace of affliction increasing your spiritual strength to a level you have never imagined before. Because what you are going to get as a result of this is resilience, is a toughness that can only come from moments of affliction spent with God. Recognizing that, you know what, it's not God's will for me to exit this boat right now. So I'm going to enjoy God's presence in this boat. Yes, the animals are making noises. They're annoying, especially those monkeys. Enough already with your running around. You're a nuisance. I don't know if Noah had cages. I don't know how it all worked. But listen, that was a messy situation. Imagine the parrots. As Noah is talking to his wife, and they imitate him. This would have been weird. 
But thank God that one day God said, you can get off the boat now. No wonder Noah sacrificed so many of the animals, but that's a joke, that's a joke, I'm sorry. That's, that's very mischievous of me, I apologize. Now then, let's move on to the next lesson. Lesson number three. The flood is a picture of being saved through baptism. In 1 Peter 3, 20 to 21, and I mentioned this last week, it says, God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Peter's point is simple. Even as Noah and his family were brought safely through the flood waters, so we are saved through the waters of baptism. And this does not mean, of course, that we can just go around baptizing infants. And it's very sad that many in the church do just that. It's something that has no biblical precedent and it's wrong. And I'll tell you why it's wrong, morally wrong, because it makes people think they are Christians when they are not. And so they are deceived into thinking that they don't need to be born again and have a Christian conversion experience because they believe they're Christian already. After all, they were christened. What a ridiculous and deceiving thing. It's wrong. Absolutely wrong. Because Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Baptism without faith, personal faith in Jesus Christ, is a waste of time. It's merely getting the baby wet. It doesn't even give them a good washing. What a waste of time. What a waste of water. It's wrong. And it's sad that such traditions crept into the church. But we know differently. But notice that baptism is important. And as someone who grew up in an evangelical context, baptism was merely reduced to some symbol. It's a symbol. It doesn't actually do anything. It's a symbol. But that's not right. Because Peter was very clear. He said in verse 21 of 1 Peter 3, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you. Now you have to do all kind of interpretative gymnastics to make that say something other than what it plainly states. How about this? He meant what he said. After all, he sat under Jesus, who said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And what did Peter himself say in Acts 2.38? He said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. In other words, baptism is for the remission, that is the forgiveness of sins. Again, you have to twist that scripture and do all kinds of stuff with it to make it mean something other than what he plainly said. If you want your sins forgiven, you need to repent and you need to baptize. It's very simple. And so I will refer to baptism the way the Bible does. I will happily say, this is for the forgiveness of sins, and this saves you, because that's what the Bible says. And if God saw it fit to inspire the Word of God to speak like that, then I want to speak in the same way. Now then, let's move on to the next lesson of the flood. The flood teaches us the importance of being ready for Christ's return. In Matthew 24... Verses 36 to 42, Jesus said, he was talking about his coming, he said, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. In other words, before the flood came, people were carrying on doing business as normal. And then suddenly the flood came. And Jesus continues. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. 
Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. You see, it can't be business as usual for the Christian. We are to watch and pray. Peter said, be serious, be disciplined for the sake of your prayers. He says, for the end of all things is at hand. In other words, when we know that we are living at the end of the days, we should be prayerful people. Because we don't want to get caught up in the deception that abounds, both in the church and outside of it. Because Jesus said there will be false prophets who will deceive even the elect, if that were possible. And many Christians, unfortunately, are feeding on a very unhealthy diet and it's called the prosperity gospel but I'm glad that that seems to be diminishing in popularity and that's a good thing and I guess the age of social media exposes a lot that is going on but nonetheless we need to be vigilant we need to be on guard a little bit of false doctrine is a dangerous thing even as a little bit of poison is you don't need a lot of poison to kill you. And it only takes a little bit of spiritual poison to kill, to deceive, to make people think God is different than He actually is. Notice the variety we are seeing in this book of Genesis. If we link chapter 2 verse 4 onwards, that creation narrative of Adam and Eve in the garden with Genesis chapter 1 it means that when God created the animals when he brought them to Adam for them to be named it means he created a new batch as it were because according to Genesis 1 God created animals before he created humans but in Genesis 2 the animals are created after Adam and they're brought to Adam for him to name them and so we can interpret that as that's a new batch of animals created just for the purpose of, animal, of Adam naming them. Now, here's the point. God can just create a new batch. So why, didn't, why did he put Noah through all of that trouble of having all those animals on the ark? God could have just recreated them after the flood. Now I have the question, I don't have the answer. And that's fine with me. If you need an answer to everything, you will struggle. In this Christian faith, you just got to trust God. And faith, yes, faith is often required because of the absence of sight. But also faith is required in the absence of understanding. Sometimes you don't know why such and such a thing is happening. Why are you going through this, that and the other? But even when you don't understand, you trust him. That's called faith. Why, Noah could have wondered, do I have to have all of these animals on this boat with me? God is almighty, isn't he? Can't he just recreate them? And in fact, why did I have to build this ark any at all? Why didn't God just create the ark for me? You know how much work that must have been? We don't always understand God's ways, and that's what Romans 11.33 tells us. It tells us that God's ways are past finding out. In other words, here's a guarantee you will not understand everything God does in your life. You won't even understand your journey fully. One day we will, thank God, but right now we don't understand everything. That's why faith and trust is required. Everyone say, I trust God, though I don't understand. And you see, this is where the Holy Spirit comes into it as well. Because you can find yourself in a situation you don't understand, but yet you're still rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. And you're still sensing His presence. And so you know, okay, it's all right. And I'm not saying we should only know it's all right when we feel something, but it just so happens that it's amazing when you don't understand something, but yet the Holy Spirit is upon you. And that gives you the peace that God is in control. Now... Before the flood, humanity was incredibly wicked. And when Jesus references Noah, his point seems to be about the fact that his return will be unexpected. 
And that's what he's emphasizing there. And now I'm making a separate point. Before the flood, humanity was incredibly wicked. In Genesis 6 verse 5 we read that it said, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. Now that is a very sad verse. I mean, we know there's wickedness now on the earth, but notice what he says. He says, he saw the wickedness of man was great, and watch this, and that every intent, everyone say every intent. So every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now that is a strong statement. And it was so bad that God said, you know what, that's enough. I'm going to wipe them out. That's how serious this was. Severe wickedness. And before Jesus returns, there shall be wickedness abounding on the earth. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5 says, But know this. Everyone say, know this. So we need to know this. Everyone say, know this. It almost sounds like a name somebody should give to their child. Novice. As a prophetic reminder that we need to know this. Right, now he says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Perilous times. He didn't say easy times. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. Notice that last one, a form of godliness. In other words, they will appear religious. There are many that will come to church. But they deny its power. In other words, they don't allow God to do a work in their heart to freedom from slavery to sin. They just have the appearance. They have the songs nice music, some religious stuff going on, but they deny its power. And I suspect that there are many people who fall into that category. And as I said about the folly of baptizing babies, that can contribute to that, because people think they have religion. After all, they, they, they were christened as a baby, um, but they never go on to encounter the life-transforming power of the gospel. Hey, they're already Christian, right? Now then, let's come back to this message here, which I will finish. In contrast to all of this, this is the fifth lesson of the flood. The flood points to the perfection of Jesus Christ. Now that's a happy contrast. Yeah, that's a real happy contrast. Now, after the rain stopped and the waters started to recede, in Genesis 8, verses 8 to 9, it says, Noah also sent out from himself a dove, everyone say a dove, to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. And she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. Now eventually, Noah would send out the dove and it wouldn't come back. But now, initially, the dove returned to Noah because it didn't find a suitable resting place. Now keep that in mind and let us consider what happened to Jesus at his baptism. And remember, the flood is a symbol of baptism. Matthew 3, 16 to 17. When he, that's Jesus, had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. 
And behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now notice the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And John's Gospel says the Holy Spirit rested on him. The point is this. Why did the Spirit come in the form of a dove? To illustrate that Jesus was a suitable resting place for the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit didn't come and go like when Noah sent the dove out because Jesus was a suitable resting place. That's why God said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. A resting place. Now, this reminds us of the importance, and note this importance very, 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 very carefully, the importance of not grieving the Holy Spirit. And remember what I said about conscience. Everyone say conscience. What did Paul say when he wrote to the Romans? He says, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. You see, he was aware of the witness of the Spirit in his conscience. Now, we therefore, you see, the Holy Spirit is very gentle. Very gentle. And he came upon Jesus as a dove. Now, in Ephesians 4 verse 30, Paul said this. Do not grieve. Everyone say grieve. grieve. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit in you can be grieved. When you sin, when you entertain thoughts that are ungodly, when you speak words that are ungodly and gossip and so on, when you act in ways that are not in keeping with God's truth, you grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieve Him. Now think of that word grief. How do you feel when you are grieved? It is a serious emotion. And the Holy Spirit, you see, He's not just some force, as the Jehovah Witnesses falsely teach. He is a person with a mind, a will and emotions, and he can be grieved. And Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit find rest in you. Don't grieve him. You see, the Holy Spirit is all you have, really. And he, believe you me, if he's grieved, you can't be joyful. When you have thoughts of doubts that you entertain, Everyone say entertain. See, as I've said to you before, you can't stop a bird landing on your head, you can stop it building a nest. Right? There are certain truths that the devil does not want you to hear. I remember, now I'm going to say this, this is, I'm not really someone who finds a demon behind every bush. But I had to reflect on two particular Sundays. I noticed when we got to the book of Revelation, and we was on Revelation 20, there was some problem and the recording didn't work. Okay. When we got to Genesis chapter 3, there was some problem and the recording didn't work. And the devil doesn't like Revelation 20 and Genesis 3. In Revelation 20, we read about his doom. In Revelation 3, in Genesis chapter 3, we read about his entrance into the world. He doesn't like those two chapters. There are certain things the devil doesn't like and doesn't want you to hear. Certain truths. I remember I, I got this book on prayer. And this is back when I used to work for a business business travel company. And I got it in my lunch break. No, I, I brought it with me to my lunch break. And it was a summer's day, so I went outside, so I opened it to read. Nice summer's day, you know, being outside, it's good for you, yeah, the air. And as I'm reading this thing, a little bird, yeah, <laughs> right on this book that I'm reading, and I'm thinking, okay. But I was serious, and you've got to be serious. You, you have to be serious about truth. So I called my boss and said, look, do you mind if I just go to a bookshop and work a bit later? So I got on the train. 
I called the Christian bookshop, see if they had it in stock, went there and got my book. I have it till this day. I haven't read it outside since, but um, I still have the book on prayer. I'm not saying we should see a devil behind every bush. I'm not trying to go there. I am saying, believe you me, there are things the devil doesn't like. Pray about everything. When you pray for this church, pray about every single detail. I actually, I cannot carry the burden of prayer by myself. Every one of you needs to pray about every detail. And sometimes we have technical problems with the songs. I think what happened, one of them didn't work. And I, I'm not, I'm not going to say it was the devil, I'm not going to say it's not, but just pray about everything. Because even the song choices, believe you me, they are not random. The order is not random. It's prayerful, it's thought through. There are transitions that need to happen because worship is a journey. God is taking us somewhere. Pray about everything in your life as well. Now, Jesus was a suitable resting place. We need to be as well. Final lesson, lesson number six. The flood teaches us the priority of worship. After Noah got out of the boat, the very first thing he did is told us in Genesis 8, verse 20 to 21. It says, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. An altar. An altar is an object where sacrifices are offered to God. And that's the first thing Noah did. He built an altar and took of every clean animal and every, every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So this was worship that was unselfish. These were burnt offerings. The whole thing was consumed on the altar and it ascended to God. And it says, and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy the living thing as I have done. Now, the implication, as far as I can tell, is that God decided that as a response to Noah's act of worship. In other words, you and me, till this day, are benefiting from Noah's act of worship. Because God said, I'm not going to destroy the world like that ever again. Why? Because Noah worshipped. And God, it pleased God so much that he promised not to destroy the world like that again. Please understand, you may think, why doesn't God send the flood now? What makes you think that you wouldn't be a victim of it? Please understand, if God dealt with us as our own merit deserved, you wouldn't have a preacher this morning. And I wouldn't have anyone to preach to. But thank God that he was pleased with Noah's act of worship and promised never to destroy the world like that again. How powerful worship is. Now that's the first thing Noah did. He didn't check if his phone had reception. That wasn't the first thing. He didn't check YouTube, Facebook, no. And you know, they had technology, believe you me. Because what did Noah do when he wanted to find out if the water had decreased enough? He sent out drones. <laughs> now that was in the original message. I just had to bring it into this one somehow. I apologize. His first act was worship. And so here's what I want to ask you today. Is, to what extent is worship a priority in your life? To what extent is it a priority of yours? Do you understand truly that you are a priest, we're part of a royal priesthood, and as a priest, part of your responsibility is to offer up to God the sacrifice of praise? It's not optional. It's part of your responsibility. Because our worship has an effect. I was mentioning last week, and we were seeing and experiencing for ourselves, how worship changes atmospheres. Worship is a priority. 
Not only when we are at church, but in our own individual lives. You are a priest. So what is your worship looking like? On Monday, what does it look like? When does it take place? When will you worship on Monday? Please, don't allow your mind not to answer that question right now. You don't have to say it out loud, but let your mind answer my question. When will you worship on Monday? What, when is the time set apart for it? And I know life is busy and tough and God knows your particular situation. Maybe you can only spare ten minutes or five minutes. Isn't that better than none? If despite the hectic nature of your life, you set apart five, ten minutes to worship God, is that not a sacrifice He is well pleased with? And worship will bless you. Because it allows you to enter into intimacy with God. Where despite everything being bad and crazy, yet you know God is with you. You have a heightened sense of His presence because you worship Him with your whole heart. You put aside your concerns for the time being and bless His holy name and worship Him. What does that do? It means you are now facing your storms and challenges with an awareness of God's presence, with a renewed confidence. It means you're coming through the storm stronger, better than when you went in. More powerful, because God's presence is with you in a special way. Jesus said this in John chapter 4. It's not about where you worship, I paraphrase. God is looking for those who worship him in the spirit and truth. Now, my translation says in spirit and truth. The NIV says in the spirit and truth. I like that. That's what I would lean towards. I could be wrong. But in Greek, when it says pneuma spirit, there's no capital S. You just have to tell by the context. But look, here's the point. He was saying, look, it's not about being in Jerusalem. It's about what's going on inside of you. And he says, look, God is looking for those who will worship him in the spirit and in truth. In other words, it must be genuine, it must be true, and it must be in the Spirit. We pray to the Father. We sang the song. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. Oh, what a song. There's some songs that cannot be written unless you know God for yourself. I think that's one of them. That you can hear. It's not just about the words. It is about the words, but I love it when the tune reflects, conveys the words. And he says, and great our rejoicing in Jesus. That you, don't, you, you have to experience that to know why he's excited about it. And there are some songs that you cannot write that are deep in theology and in experience. You know that the writer has walked with God. And listen, we come to the Father through Jesus the Son and in the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit part of your worship? You see, the, word, the Holy Spirit, He is so gentle. He doesn't draw attention much to Himself. He's concerned about you experiencing the Father and the Son, which is why we pray to the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. And I'm not talking about tongues, I'm talking about in the Spirit. You could be speaking in tongues, you could be shouting in English, but are you in the Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit makes all the difference. He is the fragrance of God's presence. When you think of the Holy Spirit, I'll give you this analogy, then I'll summarize this message. When you think about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to help your mind somehow make sense of that wonderful truth, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, who is Jesus, and the Word was with God and the Word was God. You can liken that to make sense of that. How can you understand it? Let me give you an analogy. The water was in the glass. Ice was in the water and ice was water. You understand? 
And with regards to the Holy Spirit, think of water in a pan on the stove and it's being boiled and the steam is arising from the water. You've got the picture right. The Holy Spirit proceeds from God. He's the very presence of God. The omnipresence of God is the Holy Spirit. That's why David said, where can I flee from your presence? Where can I go from your spirit? Synonymous parallelism. The spirit is the omnipresence of God. The only way you can experience God is by his spirit. He's the very atmosphere of worship. And without him, you just have religion. Let me summarize this message. The flood shows us God's ability to bring us through the most difficult circumstances. The flood teaches us that God is with us in the most difficult circumstances. The flood is a picture of being saved through baptism. The flood teaches us the importance of being ready for Christ's return. Are you ready? Let me give you a quick hint and a quick tip. If anything you decide to do is not something you would be happy to be found doing when Jesus comes, don't do it. There's a very simple test for you. If you wouldn't be happy for Jesus to find you doing that thing, I couldn't care if it is watching something you shouldn't be watching, listening to something you shouldn't be listening to, engaging in a kind of conversation you shouldn't be engaging in. If you would not be happy for Jesus to find you doing it when he returns, don't do it. It's that simple. We live ready. And the whole point of the parable of the ten virgins, what is the whole point? The point is very, very simple. It's this. When Jesus comes, it will be too late to get ready. That is the point. I don't know if you've been praying that my sermons will be short. It's not working. Five, the flood points to the perfection of Jesus. The flood teaches us the priority of Worship. And there is the summary of this message. Bow your heads with me, please. And stand to your feet. Thank you very much.